Hello, my name is Markus Tarnath and today I'm talking about VKHLF, a high-level framework I made for Vulkan, so that it's easier to use Vulkan. So, <coughs> yeah, as I said, Vulkan, VKHLF is a high-level experimental framework. The goal is not to make it as a product today, but just to research what we can do to make Vulkan easier to use. And we added a few features on top of Vulkan while trying to keep the Vulkan API feeling as much as possible. Um, so the features are first reference counting on the CPU. If you are a C++ developer, you might like reference counting, and Vulkan doesn't have anything like that. So we added this feature based on STD shared pointer. Um, next, we added resource tracking on the GPU. Um, Vulkan does not track which resources are in use at what time on the GPU side. You have to take care of it on your own, and we added some mechanisms to make it easier for you to track this feature. Um, the next step is sub-allocation. Uh, Vulkan requires you to do sub-allocations on your own. The driver does not do anything like that. And if you don't want to run into any operating system limitations when allocating memory, you have to do sub-allocation on your own. And finally, there are a few things in Vulkan which are, require a lot of lines of code, <laughs> and they're not nice to write and we try to add utility functions for those common patterns so that it's easier to start with if you want to use work. And everything is still in early stage of development, so exact there will be bugs. Um, so who's, who's the target audience? Um, so usually Vulkan is, has a target audience of ninja programmers which like everything as low level as possible. But um, Vulkan is also interesting because it allows you to have more stable drivers on more platforms than OpenGL or JVS, or it is supposed to have. And so we thought about, okay, is it possible to extend the target audience um, for, to bigger groups? And with VKHLF, I think the target audience is um, Vulkan beginners who don't want to find out everything about Vulkan before they can render their first triangle, and also students who just have to write some rendering code, but they might have CPU limitations, so they want to have it as efficient as possible. And yeah, if, if you're one of those persons, VKHLF might be a good foundation for your project. Um, so let's get to the features we added to the library. Uh, first, there's reference counting. Um, Vulkan requires you to keep the hierarchy of all Vulkan objects alive all over the time. So you might have an instance, and then you have a physical device, you have a normal device, and yeah, once you have allocated your device, you allocate device memory, and you might, uh, might allocate buffers. And so, the problem is, you can't just delete the device at any time before deleting all objects which are below the device, uh, which is specified by the spec. So if you would delete the device first, you can't delete anything below, because you don't have the device handle anymore. And as I said, the spec requests requires you to delete everything below first. Uh, so, uh, for the implementation, we decided uh, we want to use whatever C++ is providing us. So we took the STD shared pointer, and each and every Vulkan object is wrapped in some other class, which can be constructed only by returning a shared pointer. And also, each object contains a shared pointer to the parent object um, to keep your to keep the object hierarchy alive. As long as you have some device memory object um, alive, you will always keep a reference to the device upwards, so the device can't be deleted before all resources below it have been deleted. There are a few special objects um, where the lifetime is equal. For example, instance and physical device have the same lifetime, and the device and the queue also have the same lifetime. And in those cases, we are just sharing the reference count of the shared pointer is an earlier thing, and this way we ensure that we don't have any cycles in the hierarchy. Um, the next feature is resource tracking. If, if you are building up a command buffer in Vulkan, the command buffer actually does reference a lot of objects, but the driver is not responsible to track which objects have been referenced. So <coughs> you, have, you have to ensure that while a command buffer is being executed, on the GPU, all of those resources being referenced by um, the command buffers must stay alive. Otherwise, if you're lucky, you just get screen corruptions. If you're unlucky, you might get a crash or the system might reboot. 
something even worse. Um, so we thought about, OK, what, what can we do um, to make Vulkan happy? So that you, if you, call, that you can call release buffer while the GPU is re using the resources without destroying everything. Um, and release it buffer deferred automatically. And for this, we introduced a new interface we call Resource Tracker. The Resource Tracker is a class which is being called by the command buffer later. It just has a few functions to track resources. And it's responsible to keep the resource, the ref count of the resources um, higher than before, as long as the resources are being used on the GPU side. And yeah, once the command buffer has been fully built up, uh, the resource tracker knows all resources which, had, which are used by this command buffer. And if you keep the resource tracker itself alive until the GPU is done with the command buffer, we have kept all resources alive over the time. And so at some point in the future, we are going to replace uh, the virtual function uh, interface with some template interface so that we don't have the calling over it anymore by tracking, of course. And it's a little bit costly. Okay, so some of you might be asking, is this expensive? And yes, it is. Um, but is it critical? And I say, no, it's not critical, depending on how you're using the API. If you're rebuilding your command buffer each frame, yes, that's not good. But if you're trying to re reuse a command buffer, um, if, for example, if you have a big scene and you have multiple chunks in the scene, you can build one command buffer for each chunk and render the whole command buffer if it's visible or skip the whole part. This reduces a little bit of flexibility if you're doing culling, but it saves you a lot of CPU time. And in addition to this, since resource trackers an interface, you can also decide to print your own resource trackers. Uh, usually, if, depending on what you're doing, you might have a fixed set of resources um, in your frame, and it's barely changing. So you could make a resource tracker which takes all the resources from the last frame and just reuse them for this frame. And the track function itself will just do nothing, except if you're in debug mode. In this case, you could check, okay, is this resource really trained? So during development, you can check if everything is working nice and if you maybe by accident edit a resource which hasn't been tracked, and in release mode, the whole operation will be a knob and you won't have any cost for resource training. And, yeah. So, at this point, resource trackers can get very handy and useful. Um, another topic is suballocation. As I said before, Vulkan requires you to do suballocation. And <clears throat> the reason for this is the operating system doesn't have millions of possible allocations like you can do on a heap, but it has a really low amount of fixed resources. And on some operation systems, each resource will have a fixed cost if you're so the goal is not to allocate one device memory object each time you are allocating a buffer, but um, yeah, you generate one big device memory object and you sub-allocate it to this one. Okay, so VKHLF requires you to do sub-allocation um, because we want we want to ensure that you don't run into those limits. Um, and we are doing this by adding some new interface we call device memory suballocator, which is a class which is responsible for suballocation. And uh, yeah, you can implement your own allocation strategies if you want to. And at the moment, we have just a very simple one which allocates a block of a fixed size. And uh, yeah, if the block you want to allocate is bigger, you generate a new device memory object. But it works nice for what we tested. And Sub-allocation is fully transparent in our framework. Um, since we require people to use a sub-allocator, uh, yeah, you have to use it, and the device memory object will not just contain the device memory handle of Vulkan, it will also contain the offset into the sub-allocation, and all functions with accepted device memory will take this offset into account. So, sub-allocation is um, not visible to the outside, but completely handled on the inside. And finally, we, we started to implement a few utility functions to make your life easier if you want to start. For example, if you want to have a frame buffer and the corresponding swap chain, it takes a lot of lines of code to initialize those. And if you just want to start, you don't 
want to care about this yet. So we made some classes where you can have a few lines of code to initialize something you can render on and you can uh, present. Um, we also have some utility function, which is a single line interface to GLS line to compile your GLS L code to SPV code. And we also have a few functions which automatically create the device memory you need if you're creating buffers or images so that everything gets easy. And yeah, as a result, we now have a framework which um, simplifies your life uh, by doing ref counting, by doing resource tracking, sub allocations, and utility functions. And with this framework, we can now write a hello world with a triangle in about 200 lines of code instead of like 1,000 lines of code, which is already quite nice. Thank you for listening.